just want to bring your attention to a conference we're hosting via the Center for Nonlinear Studies at Los Alamos. This is located in Santa Fe, New Mexico in a month. It's a three-day conference uh, devoted to machine learning in solid earth geoscience. Um, the abstract deadline is passed, but you can still register even though the site says it's closed. So if you're interested, please do come and join us. So I, I just wanted to start by way of uh, kind of a two-dimensional analogy in terms of our objectives. So here's the problem. You have, you have some image and it's masked or there's a tremendous amount of noise or you just are collecting pieces of the data, in, in this case, uh, su successively. So the question is, can you identify the image? And beyond that, can you get at information regarding the, the sort of the physics of the image? And I'll pose that question in, ju in just a moment again. So you might imagine that you're collecting pixels of data so far uh, you don't know what it is. Maybe you have an algorithm that's been trained that actually can, can pick it up straight away. But as you move forward and inspect this space with more data, of course you gain more information. The problem becomes easier and easier. And very soon you do the simple problem and you know what the image is. So, the question though is, that's the problem, it's very easy for people in this room that do this kind of image recognition and has been for some time. But the question is, what about information regarding how it was painted? Can you tell me whether or not the painter used optics to paint this painting? Can you tell me about the pigments that he used in the painting? Can you tell me what direction the light was coming from, if there were mirrors involved, etc.? That information you can't tell me unless you're an expert in analyzing paintings, but can the machine tell me? So what are the underlying physics behind what produced this work aside from the artist's technique itself? So that's the 2D uh, analogy to the problem at hand. So let's go to the um, the objective of our problem after this slide. Let me introduce my uh, colleagues and collaborators. The people doing the, the heavy lifting here are Bertrand Rouet Le Duc and Claudia Aubert and Nicholas Lovers. These are postdocs and students working on our team along with Kipton Barros, uh, Robert Geyer, myself, and about uh, 10 other people involved in various aspects of this project. So, Here's the follow-on sort of objective laid out, laid out in, uh, in this um, simulation. So you have a fault here, the Southern San Andreas Fault, and I'm going to show you uh, a rupture along that fault based on a simulation here from, from Southern California Earthquake Center. But the, you have a number of seismic stations uh, noted by these triangles. I just stuck these on the map. And the, each one of those uh, recordings may have one or three components measuring displacement or velocity, particle velocity or acceleration as a function of time. So you have a long, long data stream. You also have GPS uh, stations located in this region that are telling you about displacements, both vertical and horizontal displacements. And you may have other ge uh, geophysical measurements that measure strain, uh, tilt, et cetera. So the question is, if I'm making a measurement of that time signal, can I learn about the physics of the fault? And if so, if, if that's my question, how do I do it? So that's really the objective of what, what I'm showing you here. Along the way, can I learn information that may give us some idea about the magnitude, et cetera, or, and location about what, uh, where that fault may initiate and ex its extent? So that is our general objective here. 
Uh, knowing that, let me just show you the simulation because it's super cool, especially if you haven't seen this kind of thing. So you can see the fault initiates, the rupture initiates in the southeast, it propagates to the north, uh, the red and yellow are the surface waves propagating away from it. And you can see that as the waves propagate into the Los Angeles basin, there's an amplification effect and you get sort of standing wave effects and very strong gravitation. So Los Angeles, Long Beach in particular, is a terrible place to live. <laughs> as, as, is, as is Oxnard and just below Santa Barbara. Let's just look at it one more time in case, for those of you who live here, to, <laughs> to see if you're living in a place you shouldn't be living. So you can see in the mountains there's a lot of scattering and the waves dissipate quite rapidly, but as you go down the fault into uh, the, the basin and the LA basin, you get these kinds of ringing effects. So. This is typical of soft sediments, thick soft sediments, and many cities, Mexico City is another great example, are built on soft sediments. So they're not optimal places to build cities, but often that's where they are. So given all of that, let's move on. Um, I don't know what I'm saying here except, okay, I think I already posed this question. Just a question, is that that's seismic wave propagation simulation, right? Yes, that was a simulation. Okay, so, so, so you, can actually, you can actually measure these kinds of surface displacements now with, with high frequency GPS. Um, so, so it's possible to kind of create this image uh, from, uh, from, from this, this sort of image from GPS. Oh, it's good. It's not, it's not, it's not a simulation solving the, the, the elastic it is indeed. It's exactly that. Yeah, but this, this is just simulation. This is not an actual observation. So this is what would be expected. This is one of the expected types of rupture you might expect on the southern San Andreas Fault. So, so let's go to a problem I mentioned at the beginning. There's a very famous seismologist, many of you in the room know who this gentleman is, named Benno Gutenberg. And one, he and Richter were sort of the grandfathers of seismology last century. He worked at Caltech, and this is in response to a request from the general public. This laboratory does not predict earthquakes. Specific prediction, predictions giving time and place come from <coughs> amateurs, publicity seekers, believers in the occult, or just plain fools. Los Angeles remains exposed to the risk of a great earthquake which may take place at any time. So this is the attitude uh, in the geoscience community that earthquakes are impossible to predict. I don't think anybody in this room would disagree with that, but the question is, can we, <coughs> applying new techniques, can we tease out more of the frictional physics of the fault that inform us about future events? And really that's the, a primary goal of the work of our team. So with bearing that in mind, because we don't want to be considered any of these things, um, we, ha we have to step lightly. And in fact, in our submittals of our papers uh, on this topic over the last year and a half, it's been demoralizing because this attitude uh, has kind of dominated the response to our papers. But that will change, I think, as time goes by. And maybe you'll see why today. So. So our overall objectives here are to uncover as yet identified signals that may be informing us of underlying physics. So that's it in a nutshell. And to improve failure predictions along the way. So, so we'll focus on fault slip here. Um, and I'll, I'll provide an overview of this problem and other problems, some background on faulting and earthquakes for those of you in the mathematics community and machine learning communities that, that are, may not be very familiar with this topic. Then I'll go to experimental work that we're conducting to, to support this and we're analyzing these data applying machine learning. And then I'll summarize and conclude and tell you where we are today and where we're going. So there are much, uh, many uh, related problems to this, that some of which we're working on simultaneously. So in the upper left you see um, an avalanche and you might imagine that um, all the physics leading up to an earthquake slip 
and to an avalanche, or many of them could be quite similar, and indeed they are. Same is true of landslides, and that's on the right-hand side. The same is true, there's oceanic landslides called turbidite flows, that's the bottom left. And then volcano and geysers have very, have sort of the same signatures in terms of leading up to eruptions uh, and, and geyser, geyser eruption and volcanic eruption, or some of them, at least it appears to be so. So we're working on a subset of these problems as well, as I say. This is just simply to show something kind of cool and really for no other reason, okay? But I will make a point after I show it to you, and I hope you can hear it, so be very quiet. Okay, so these are three types of seismic signatures recorded um, by seismometers in Earth. This is by our, our, colleague, our colleague and collaborator, Zhigang Peng at Georgia Tech. And first you see and heard a nuclear blast. That's a spectrogram on the bottom. Then a magnitude five earthquake and then a meteor impact. This is the one I believe that was in Russia a couple of years ago. So the, the, interest, the interesting thing is that of course there is a there's a, a very uh, noticeable, measurable signal from which you can determine a lot about the event, especially if you have multiple stations for each of these uh, uh, physical phenomenon. But the question is, and that we're posing is, what about in between? So you have signal here, you have signal here that just looks like noise. You're recording microseisms, the kind of thing that Michel Campillo uses for imaging in the earth. Uh, you're rec recording wind, wind noise, uh, uh, free oscillations of the earth, et cetera. And the question though is, is there also information contained in there that might be emanating from a fault nearby or a group of faults that we're just missing today because we haven't had the ability to analyze them. So let's go to um, a little bit of forecasting background. I already gave you a little background. Um, so so this, is, this is sort of the state of the art. Despite significant effort, earthquake prediction still remains elusive. I think everybody in the room knows that. Despite some correct predictions such as blah, 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 inaccurate predictions abound. And so whenever somebody tries to predict an earthquake um, and they're right, they say, aha, I can predict earthquakes and nobody believes them. And when somebody says, aha, I cannot predict an earthquake because I failed, and usually these are back predictions, but not always. The Parkfield earthquake prediction was preceded the, the earthquake and was wrong. So, so, you know, it's just, it's just an indication of, of the, the skepticism in the community, community and also the difficulty of the problem. So this is a recent paper that uh, is a very nice overview if you're interested in this topic. And so, the, so previous and current machine learning efforts are based, uh, that are focused on forecasting, use, um, use what are known as earthquake catalogs, and especially precursors leading to failure. So you, have a sequence, you can have a sequence of a, impulsive events, small earthquakes, that is to say, preceding a, a large event, and that information can be very valuable in regards to uh, the, the fact that an event may be coming. You may not know exactly when, but you know it's coming based on kind of rate changes in the precursors. The interesting thing, though, is that you don't always see them. So in certain instances, you see precursors. In other instances, you don't. The question is why? Because in all systems in the laboratory that I'm aware of, you always see precursors. So maybe it's just a question of sensitivity of instruments, density of instruments, et cetera. So there, there are issues there, but, but um, in some sense, it's beside the point for what we're getting at. 
because we care about the signals in between those, pre we, we care about those precursors, but we also care about all the signal taking, uh, that's being emanated from a fault zone in between the precursors. So given that, um, oh yeah, and I was gonna say, Greg, Greg so, so, so not to say that, so, so people build earthquake catalogs so they can do many things regarding, regarding earthquakes and faulting. So Greg showed, uh, Greg Barroza showed a really nice example where uh, applying the method, I think it's the next slide, uh, the fingerprinting method Greg descri described, I guess it was yesterday, showed that you could get really high resolution maps of fractures, for example, in hydraulic fracturing um, uh, work in Arkansas. You could actually see remarkably the, the evolution of the fracture networks associated with hydraulic fracture for each sequence of fractures as they, as they moved the hyd hydraulic fracturing underground across the horizontal space where hydraulic fracturing was taking place. So it's incredibly useful information about where and when uh, events are taking place. Um, regarding, however, what we want to do in terms of probing fault physics and pot potentially making uh, progress on, on, on the forecasting question, again, we turn to the continuous data. So, you know, just to show you, because it's another cool movie, I stole it from the web, I think I got it from the USGS, so this is not our work, but I, just to show you a sequence of foreshocks and the main shock and aftershocks for the large Tohoku event, which took place in 2011, which the event itself didn't uh, do that much damage or kill that many people, but the tsunami was devastating, as everybody in this room knows. So. Let's see. I hope the movie's working. The movie is media is not found. Well, take my word for it. <laughs> that media was there this morning. It's so strange. So okay, let's let's carry on. But anyway, so frequently you have a sequence of foreshocks, you have a main shock, and then you have aftershocks. This is typical of what you see with an earthquake, and it's those foreshocks that um, that provide information about the upcoming event. So again, just to reiterate, um, you, have, you have earthquake signals, uh, various uh, phases as they're called, body waves, the compressional wave, the shear wave, which travels more slowly. You have surface waves propagating across the earth. The surface waves are what I showed you in that movie uh, from the simulation. And um, the question is, I, I just reiterate, the question is, what about that information that's preceding and following that discrete event? So we throw, we've typically, historically, thrown that information away. We take that, they we take that event, we put it in a catalog, all the rest of the information is abandoned, either in the past because we didn't have the memory capability to store it, or we were recording it in analog, also, as Greg showed, eventually as we recorded digitally, we still didn't have the ability to store the data for long periods of time, and there was just too much. So it just wasn't kept, now it is. So we have massive, massive amounts of continuous data. So this is the time. This is the time we can address a question like this. Because we have the, the tremendous amount of data, we have really fast computers at, at my workplace, and we have the ability to handle massive quantities of data. So, uh, that's obvious, I guess. So, so here's kind of our general approach before I get down to just the results I'll show you from the laboratory. We're working at many, many scales, uh, actually simultaneously, but we work on 2D laboratory, uh, or, uh, both experiments and simulation, 3D laboratory experiments and simulation, um, using different kinds, discrete element simulation and a, and a hybrid discrete element and finite element a simulation. We're doing 2D analytic uh, models as well, something known as a brittle ductile friction model. There are others, rate state friction is one of them. Then, then we're using a large scale interacting fault model based on rate state friction. 
Uh, that's familiar to some of you, but not all of you. It doesn't really matter. It's just a frictional model. It's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a frictional model that's commonly used. And then we're working at small scale in Earth in mine injection experiments and simultaneously with tectonic data in the Earth. And these are sort of some of the conceptual ideas of how these experiments and simulations work at smaller scale. So I'm going to show you just results from the uh, 2D and 3D experiments, and we're going to analyze those and then speculate. So this is, just, this is also just cool. This is a really crude 2D experiment, but it's very informative. This is using something called photoelasticity, which you may or may not be familiar with, but it allows you to see the stress localization in a granular material, which we consider the fault gouge. This material here, consider this as kind of a fault block that's being driven across the surface. And you can see the evolution of these stress chains or force chains in the granular material. So the, so the stress is transmitted across the fault gouge we imagine something like in this manner where you have chains of force uh, extending from one side to the other side which support uh, or carry the strength of the material. They evolve, of course, as the material shears. And so I'll just speed this up um, so you can see it move forward rapidly. Go, go back. So anyway, this, these are early experiments uh, that we did with Bob Berenger at Duke University. He's a physicist that's uh, heavy into granular materials and, and applying photoelasticity. So this is work done at Los Alamos with a, with a 2D apparatus. It's much more quantitative, where, where what, what you'll see here is, is the fault gouge, which are these particles here. The fault plates are here and here. And what you'll see as the, as the, I think the top plate goes this way, as I recall, at different load levels, you'll see the evolution of what happens to these particles. This really has not much to do with the talk. Uh, it, it would appear at the moment, but we'll come back to it because it really does matter. So, Okay, let's learn one more time while my phone rings. Okay, so one more time. Just put, focus your eye on one load level and just track it. So you can see that there's a displacement, you know, in uh, the, the kinetic energy that you could that you extract from the grain movements uh, would vary with applied load and also at slip event time, for example. And so this is the same experiment, but now we're showing, we're zooming out, also, we're showing this also at three different load levels, but now we're showing the fault plates on either side as well. Here and here are the plates. Here's the applied force here in each case. We're increasing the load as we go this way. The block is shearing this way. And again, we're using photoelasticity. So these regions of, of uh, color, in contrast to the kind of the yellowish background, are stress concentrations. And you can see how they evolve, but they're highly localized as you shear the system. So let's take a look at that. Again, focus your attention on one of the panels. And um, I think that helps from being confused by looking at so many. One more time. So, so there's a lot of really complicated behavior, even in this, very two, in this 2D system. And by the way, we know from simulation and experiment that, that there are big differences between 2D and 3D. But nonetheless, we can learn quite a bit from the 2D, realizing that in 3D we have uh, a, richer, a richer physical phenomenon going on. So, um, I better get moving if it's really 11 o'clock. So here's our earthquake machine that located at Penn State. Chris Marone operates this thing. He doesn't call it the earthquake machine. I do, and now all of his students do. And um, so, as, so, the, so again, for some reason the movie's not working, but it doesn't matter. We hold a three-block system in place with an applied load. 
We drive this block down at constant velocity. We measure the sound coming out of the system. We can measure the shear stress and uh, the, the gouge layer thickness. There's two gouge layers just because of the nature of the experiment and because um, you're driving that central block down. So I'm going to, oh, yes? Could you address the, the scaling uh, problems that running this at this time as opposed to geologic time? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, you can. Yes, you can, sort of. Um, but in, in, in some sense, it doesn't matter, uh, okay? Uh, and for reasons I don't have time to go into right now, but maybe at the question time period. So, so these are the kinds of data that come out of this. This is shear stress as a function of experimental runtime. This is for uh, most of the experiment, that forest or vertical lines. Each one of those is an earthquake, a slip <coughs> event in the laboratory. So you see a stress drop, which corresponds also to a friction drop. If you zoom in on that, you see the same thing here. And those open circles on top are just showing you where identified precursors are located as you approach failure. These are impulsive precursors as you approach failure. The, these were something we were analyzing three, four years ago before we looked at continuous data. So now, this is just continuous data coming out of the machine. And, and I don't know about you, but it looks like noise to me, and that's what I thought it was. There is a slip event here associated with this is shear stress as t with time. This is, this is just amplitude, dynamic strain, but think of it as a voltage, as a function of time. A slip event, slip event, you see they correspond. But in between, what's going on? It seems like nothing's really going on, at least nothing that I can identify by eye. But what if we turn uh, a machine alg learning algorithm loose on this by first training it and then testing it? So, so we're using random forest, uh, decision tree approaches in general, and the reason we're not using uh, something like neural networks is because we want to know exactly what is going on with the algorithm at every step. And as probably most of you know in the room, in the know, you, room know, you can do that with random forest, actually all the decision tree approaches. So it was very intentionally done that we picked simple methods like this. So, um, so in our case, um, X, X sub i is the acoustic signal that I showed you before, and Y sub i is the time to failure, right? So in supervised learning problem like this, where we use the training data, uh, X sub i to predict the target value Y sub i. I'm sorry, I'm speaking fast now because I'm running out of time. So this is what, this is, so our target is really the time to failure and we base it strictly on the acoustic signal during the testing phase. In the training phase, the data are, the, the, the algorithm is allowed to see both of the, this signal and that signal. So it knows when a slip event takes place. So, you know, as, as probably most of you or all of you know, in the room, uh, this kind of learning tr tr decision tree approach is really robust because you resample the, the uh, feature space over and over again to create a new tree. You have many trees in the forest, a thousand trees in the forest, and the net prediction from all the trees gives you the result. In this case, time to failure, which you see on the right. These trees are, yeah, information about um, information about the approach. So I'm just reiterating here what I said. We have a training set here that comp is comprised of these two kinds, of, these two data sets. Our target value, y sub i, is this time. We want to know, uh, can we predict from this signal when this takes place um, and only from this signal during testing. Okay, so I reiterate that's all we've got during the testing procedure is just the noise coming out of the system. We use a moving window analysis, look like this is schematically shown here, and it's just this is time to failure, and you can see we have a moving window that's overlapping by 90% and stepwise going through the, the um, acoustical data. So at each time window, we create uh, the random forest, we make a prediction of when this will take place, and that's how it's done. So, 
yeah, anyway, I won't go into the data snooping, et cetera. But I just want to show you what you'll be looking at in the result, which is the next slide. So I've turned the shear stress signal on its side. So here's experimental runtime. So I just turned it by 90 degrees from the previous figure. This is the shear stress then. And so this is for one slip cycle. Here's the earthquake here. And what you're going to look for in the next slide is, first of all, you're going to see a plot of time to failure versus experimental runtime. And the uh, time to failure is based on the shear stress data. It's the red line. So it has nothing to do with the testing procedure. It's just there to, to tell us how well we're doing and to compare statistically how well we're doing. The, the prediction, which is a regression, uh, uh, is, is going to be the blue line. So let's see that result. And so this is something, if you were here last year, I, I showed this um, as well. We've made a lot of progress since, since this time. But I think this was the first most robust result and to us was incredibly powerful. So again, here's our signals. We're training only, we're testing only on this signal. Here's the time to failure. Here's experimental runtime. And each one of these vertical lines represents a slip event, okay? So the very interesting thing is that as soon as you had a slip event, boom, the regression is spot, essentially spot on with the red dashed line, which is the time to failure obtained from the shear stress. And so it gets the time to failure all the way down to the actual failure time with an R squared of point, uh, 0.89 for the training, excuse me, for the testing data, which is pretty darn good. So, so the, the amazing thing to us was how the hell did the system know that there was information, what information is contained in here that allows the prediction to take place? Because we knew there were precursors that take place in this region that correspond to this region, but why on earth was there, was there a prediction allowed earlier in time during the full, in fact, the full stress cycle? I'm going to talk, to, I'm going to tell you why in a moment, but Notice that even when you have intermittent smaller events, it still gets it. There's another, that's a zoom of, of the case of a smaller event here too. So despite the fact that you have irregular, it looks very periodic. And it is periodic in terms of these um, earthquakes in the laboratory, but, just, but there are some aperiodicities and they, the, the random forest can still pick them out. So why? What's going on in this region with the time signal? Shear stress and the time signal again. What's going on in here if you zoom in on it compared to here where you have these impulsive precursor events? You can see that one. It's a really distinct precursor. But this, we just, just as I mentioned before, disregarded it because we thought it was noise. But in fact, the machine learning tells us that indeed there's a signal there. And that, that signal is due to the creaking and grinding, the movement of the, the, the fault gouge, uh, the grains against themselves, and also the, um, against the, the fault blocks themselves. So it's, it's making this creaking and grinding noise that we're picking up uh, with the, the sensors. And that's the why. We, I don't, we would not have learned this had we not applied this uh, machine learning approach or machine learning at all. So it was completely unexpected. Um, and it showed us how bad our biases were going into this, us, us just abandoning what we thought was noise, which was actually the most important signal in the system. So, so it turns out that we were, I didn't mention this, but we used about 100 statistical features in feature space. And there turned out to be some really, the most important or the most robust one, robust one turns out to be the, the, the normalized moments, kurtosis skewness. Uh, but in particular, the variance are the best predictors. And so this is the variance, the log of the variance, as a function of time to failure for many, many slip events. And what you can see is that the variance increases. This is a histogram. The variance increases as you approach failure. So the prediction gets better and better as you approach failure, in particular because you've got those impulsive precursor signals incorporated into the background grinding and creaking going on. 
but nonetheless you can make the prediction from back here. This suggests that you can learn about the frictional state of the fault at any time during this uh, procedure, in fact. And so that was the ne next step we took. We used a slightly different approach, something called gradient boosted trees that is, is very familiar to some of you, perhaps not to others, just another decision tree approach. And so let me just point out here, um, here's the experiment again, our two fault layers. We have uh, detectors embedded in, this, in the side blocks of the fault. This is one full experiment. This is shear stress as a function of experimental runtime. You can see, again, this forest of vertical lines, which are indeed earthquakes in the laboratory. And you can see that they change in, in their character as time goes by, as this thing is sheared more and more. If you look at a recorded signal, the acoustic signal, this is highly, heavily desampled. Uh, this is, this is uh, training input here and testing input here. Uh, you can, this corresponds to the shear stress signal over here. So again, this is what's used in training. And what we're doing here is posing the question of, can this signal, can this t if we take portions of this signal, can we instantaneously determine what the shear stress or friction is on the fault? Because we've speculated we could based on the fact that we could predict. So, so, when, so, so what we do here then is go through this, this, the, the same procedure, training, training and testing using gradient boosted trees. And what we find is this. Here now, is, the red line is the same as it was here. It's a zoom, in fact, of a portion of this data. This, in fact, the testing data itself. And so the re that's, that's the red line, is directly from the shear stress data. The blue line is the regression from the gradient boosted trees output. So you can see that it does a very, very good job, R squared is 0.92, of capturing the shear stress and therefore the friction, because the friction is only then divided by the normal load. The shear stress divided by the normal load gives you the friction. And friction is incredibly important variable to, for, for how faults work. So remarkably, uh, we can capture the frictional state of the fault at any time, at any time in the stress cycle. So if you give me a random piece of, of the time signal, I can tell you exactly what the friction is. And in fact, you can come up with an equation of state um, that describes that, and that's what I'm showing on the left. So it's the acoustic signal power normalized, which is, which is the variance. So again, the variance is the important, most important variable. Um, the, other, the other higher mo order moments are also important, but it, the variance is the most important. So we, can, we, we, have a, we have a relationship then between the power and the friction on the fault. And this is from all of the slip events. So, so again, if, if, I if I measure the acoustic power at any time during the experimental runtime, I can, I can back out what the friction is from this relationship. And I can do that at different, under different experimental conditions by doing, doing a normalization procedure. Everything collapses onto the same curve. This we also found really remarkable because uh, we wouldn't have expected that the acoustic signal can, can give us directly the friction at any time during the stress cycle and that you could actually come up with an equation of state that describes it. So I don't have time to go into slow slip. Uh, my time is essentially up, so we've done experiments. For those of you geoscientists in the room that uh, know about slow slip and realize uh, how interesting it is and, and how widespread this observation is in Earth, uh, we've done lab experiments to, um, to study it. We'll go on from that. So here's the take home message. Um, I, didn't even I didn't bring up Earth. If you have questions about that, ask me at the end. Um, but here's the take home message. The timing of laboratory stick slip and slow slip can well be well, well forecasted. Machine learning identifies previously unknown signals. The seismic signal is a signature of the instantaneous fault friction. And we're currently also applying the approach to Earth. And these are some of the machine lear learners, uh, Cla Claudia Bertrand and, and Nick.